Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and today we have an extremely cool and rare rifle to take a look at. This is an Afghan contract Schlegel Milk carbine. And it is the first and only one of these I have ever seen. I have been able to find actually zero information pertaining specifically to this rifle. However, uh, there are a number of things that we can infer about it based on what we know about the Afghans, the Kabul arsenal, where this was marked from, uh, as well as the other work of Louis Schlegelmilk, who is the guy who designed the system. So let's start with both aspects of this story, and then we can put them together and take a look at this carbine. Uh, Louis Schlegelmilk was a gunsmith at the Spandau Arsenal, as well as the commercial side, the Spandau Gewehrfabrik, uh, in Germany. He was responsible for some of the elements, really one of the elements, the bolt system, for the Gewehr 88, aka the commission rifle, in Germany. This was a rifle that was adopted for German military service, the, um, based on a variety of patent ideas from a variety of different inventors, put together by a committee, instead of, say, the Mauser 98 that would follow it that was entirely the product of one specific inventor and company. So Schlegelmilk had a hand in the bolt design there, he worked at the Spandau Arsenal, and he developed this very interesting alternative bolt-action rifle operating system, which was submitted to German military trials in the late 1890s, 1896 to 1897. We know about this because we actually had a chance to take a look at one of those German trials rifles. So I have a previous video on that gun. If you find this interesting you should definitely go back and check that video out, and you'll be able to see firsthand uh, the many similarities and some of the differences between that rifle and this one. Now if we shift our focus over to Afghanistan, about a decade before Louis Schlegelmilk's rifle was being tested by the German military, the Kabul arsenal was being built. This was really a, a true modern arsenal, or close to it, on the site of a former basically smallish hand manufacturing weapons shop, and it was set up by the then Emir of Afghanistan, one Abdur Rahman Khan. He is, was pretty much an iron-fisted dictator, but also a, a very serious and significant proponent of modernization of Afghanistan, and he would bring in a whole bunch of modern equipment and set up tons of small bits of industry in this big complex in Kabul. Uh, he did this primarily with the help of a British agent by the name of Salter Pine, kind of a, an explorer, adventurer, British agent who worked with the Emir uh, to procure modern machinery. So he would go back to Europe with like literal bucket loads of money from the, from the Afghan treasury and buy up machines and industry. And they set up all sorts of things. They set up obviously an arsenal that had uh, barrel making machinery that had everything else you would need to manufacture guns, uh, lathes, mills, forging equipment, welding equipment. They then also set up a powder manufacturing facility, they set up a modern leather tannery, they set up a spirits distillery, they set up, what else, they built some narrow gauge railway in the area, uh, electrical generating machinery, steam power machinery, like all sorts of, of modern cutting-edge equipment in Kabul. And by the 1890s the Kabul arsenal had actually set up, or, or purchased, compl a complete tooling production line for the Martini Henry rifle, and they were able to produce a couple dozen rifles per day that were of a standard that was, well perhaps not best in the world, it was equal, equivalent, satisfactory at least to uh, then current European standards, which is really pretty impressive, considering that the work that had to go into just getting this machinery to Kabul involved like tearing down the machine tools and packing them onto donkeys, elephants, and hiking them through the mountains to get them to Kabul. This was not a well-connected part of the world at that point. So uh, Sultan Abdur Rahman Khan is very interested in modernizing the Afghan military. He sees this, uh, the, basically the armament of the Afghan uh, population writ large as a way to ensure Afghanistan's independence uh, and their ability to be taken at least somewhat seriously by other modern powers of the era. So uh, in addition to manufacturing his own Martini Henrys, which was the primary work of the Kabul arsenal, he also experimented with other guns of the era. And the most, uh, most well-known one, really the only 
kind of well-known one, uh, is the Steyr Monlicker model of 1890 carbine. That's the Steyr straight pull carbine, the 1890 pattern, which slightly predated the 1895. Uh, production of those carbines ended by like 1896 uh, in Europe, or for Europe, but there was a contract um, that was made for somewhere around a thousand, possibly less, almost certainly not more than a thousand, Steyr 1890 straight pole carbines specifically for Afghanistan, and they will be found marked with the same Kabul Arsenal uh, crest that we will see on this rifle. So to set this up, uh, just to, to put it all together for you, what we have here is the Emir of Afghanistan very interested in modern arms. He manufactures his own single shot rifles, but he's clearly interested in other current developments and looking potentially to buy guns from European countries. We have a wide variety of European arms manufacturers who are always looking for new export uh, clients, new contracts, and they would send guns to Afghanistan to be tested by the Emir. This guy is known in geopolitical circles to have a lot of money and an interest in new guns, and so hey, why not send a, send a few over? We then have Louis Schlegelmilk, who has, unfortunately for him, had his rifle rejected by the German military, but the arsenal that he works for at Spandau is still potentially interested in marketing this. And so I believe what happens is a couple get sent to Kabul for investigation, and that is what we have here. Let's begin with the receiver markings here. On the top we have the crest of Abdur Rahman Khan. Uh, that's a little what's referred to in the collector circuit as the mosque crest. There is also there are a couple other Afghan Kabul Arsenal crests, but below that we have a line of writing which translates to Kabul workshops, and below that a date. This is a date in uh, the Hajiri, Hijri, I'm going to butcher that, but it is a date in an Afghan calendar uh, that literally translates to 1321, which when we convert it to the Gregorian calendar is 1903, which is interesting. That puts this rifle as manufactured after the German trials were well and truly complete. And it means that perhaps Schlegelmilk and Spandau had some time to reflect on improvements to the design and uh, put together something that they thought might have a better chance of commercial adoption. The other marks that we'll find on here are a profusion of serial numbers. These are serial numbered in Dari, and uh, this rifle is number 24, which between that and the fact that I've never seen one of these before anywhere else suggests to me that it is one of a very small batch uh, that were sent to Kabul for trials. Now it's worth pointing out that this Kabul arsenal crest and marking was put on both on rifles that were manufactured in Kabul, and also rifles that were basically taken into military service in Kabul. So the presence of this marking doesn't really say anything about whether the gun was actually made in Kabul. Um, there are no other manufacturer's marks inside that I could find, no European proof marks. There's another serial number 24, by the way. Um, nothing else that I, I could see that would uh, give some clue as to exactly where it was manufactured. However, on the German trial Schlegel milk that I uh, filmed a few years ago, I think it's worth pointing out that there were also no markings on that aside from serial number. Starting at the back end of the rifle, we have a trapdoor, a storage compartment in here for a cleaning rod. There's nothing in there anymore, unfortunately. We have a heavily worn but still recognizable Kabul Arsenal roundel stamp in the buttstock here. I can't read that well enough to translate any of the information on it, but it is clearly a Kabul Arsenal stamp. We have a really significant semi-pistol grip design to the stock, which is unusual and interesting. And there is a sling bar uh, on the left side of the wrist, which to me immediately suggests a comparison to the Steyr straight pull carbines. All right, now the bolt and the magazine. The biggest difference between this and the German trial Schlegelmilk, as well as the handful of German sporting Schlegelmilk rifles that were made, is that this is designed around a Monlicker style uh, end block clip magazine. So uh, very similar to the Steyr Monlicker straight pull rifles, as well as the Gewehr 88 that Schlegelmilk was involved in. We can open up the bolt, and you can see the follower here. This particular rifle uh, appears to be perfectly set up for Gewehr 88 clips. Um, whether it was intended for use with the old pattern 88 round nose 8mm, 
or the more modern Spitzer 8mm, I don't know for sure, but uh, the clip fits in there very nicely. We have a clip release button right here, which allows the clip to be pushed back out. Um, I mean this, this clip fits so perfectly that to me there's really no question that this was designed for the 8x57 cartridge using, and by the way these an 8x57 does chamber in the, the bore and the barrel, although I haven't actually done a chamber cast of it. Um, but the clip fits perfectly, locks into position at just the right point, and to me that's pretty definitive. We have an interesting latch here, which inside the rifle, when I push this forward, it pushes forward a little notch, a little catch. Um, I'm not 100% sure on the intended purpose of this, but I suspect it was there to hold the clip in place to prevent it from falling out the bottom of the action, which is what would normally happen when the last round was chambered. It is interesting to point out that the Afghan Contract Steyr 1890 straight poles have a similar sort of latch, although it's down on the magazine, um, that holds the clip in place. So I suspect that was the idea here, but I can't prove it. There is also a nicely thought out dust cover um, that will snap into place. Uh, it doesn't. This one, obviously this whole rifle is kind of worn, uh, it's been in Afghanistan for 120 years. Uh, but the dust cover folds back here when not in use, and when you want to prevent gunk from getting into the magazine it snaps into place right there. If you need to get a new clip in, and you have a clip in the rifle, uh, jamming a second clip down on top will force that dust cover open, uh, actually very similar to the M16 pattern of Berthier's. To remove the bolt we need only pull the trigger back, and then that drops the bolt release. We can pull the bolt off. The bolt here has two big front locking lugs. Uh, it is obviously a turn bolt design, and in fact I can take the bolt body straight off of this very distinctive Schlegel Milk sort of action cover here. Um, I believe you would pull this back and you'd be able to unlock it and pull the firing pin uh, out the front. And then you have your firing pin spring right in there. So when you uh, cock the action this is your sear, which gets held right there. So when you pull the trigger this drops, releases the striker right there to fire. We have the same sort of large extractor uh, in front of the right bolt lug uh, as on the German Schlegel milk. Interesting that it's actually held in place by a screw, that's a bit unusual. It's also worth pointing out that as far as I can tell this rifle has no manual safety. On the German versions of the gun there was a safety flag, very much Mauser style, located above the striker right back here. It clearly hasn't been removed from this piece because in the German versions the forging for this component had a, a big extra chunk of material up here that housed the safety. So it appears to me that this rifle was intended to be run, again rather like a Berthier, uh, without a manual safety. The rear sight is fairly typical in design. We have a uh, battle sight V-notch at the back and then an adjustable slider so you can lift the sight up. Uh, and adjust it for longer ranges. It is also marked in Dari, like the rest of the numbers on the rifle. And interestingly the markings are uh, 7, 9, 11, 13, 15, and 18. And then there's another V-notch at the top which would presumably be probably 2000. Um, and presumably meters, but I couldn't say 100% for sure. Our middle barrel band here uh, is not appropriate to this rifle, it's a replacement. It obviously doesn't fit uh, properly. This the, the original barrel band has been lost at some point. The front barrel band however does appear to be uh, original and correct. Well, notice, now this is where we can get into one of the really cool elements here. This entire gun can be disassembled without a screwdriver, because there are no screws on the gun. The only one you'll see is here on this barrel band, and that's not an original component. So I can remove the front band by pushing the spring down pulling that off. I can then do the same here, push that spring down, and we can pull this barrel band off. Oh, and I should point out uh, a pretty typical barleycorn style windage adjustable front sight there. Now the German Schlegel milk had a little locking lever that held the uh, magazine and trigger guard in place. This system is a little bit different. We have a spring-loaded latch here. All I have to do is pull that latch back, and then the trigger guard pops out there, and it's held in place simply by a little lip on the front. 
this comes out without any tools at all. And once the trigger guard is out, I can then take the action out of the stock. So there's the rifle field stripped without a single tool, and that's really cool. That's uh, definitely a credit to Louis Schlegelmilk and his design ingenuity. I touched on a few of these features when we looked at the German trial Schlegelmilk, but I want to repeat them here for those of you who haven't seen that video. The way that this rifle is built is actually with a barrel that is dovetailed into the receiver right here. What that means is that the manufacturing of the receiver is extremely simple, where the Mauser has the barrel uh, thread into a receiver and then the bolt locks into the back of the receiver, thus requiring a substantial amount of precision machining on the receiver itself, as well as heat treating, because the receiver is a pressure bearing part on a Mauser. On the Schlegelmilk design, the bolt lugs lock into the barrel here. And so you could take the receiver completely off, in theory if you had a way to hold all the parts in the right orientation, uh, and the gun would be entirely safe to fire without a receiver, because the bolt locks into the barrel. The receiver is just there to hold the trigger and the bolt all in their you know, correct orientations while the action is being cycled, and of course to hold the firing control parts in place. So this makes the gun much simpler to manufacture. You don't have broaching, you don't have, you have easy access to all of the machined elements of this receiver. You can see we have uh, the rear stud, what would normally be a screw, instead just has this little notch in it. And right here we have the lever that locks that locks into that notch and holds the trigger guard in place. We have our follower, which has a coil spring up in the front of the magazine compartment to put tension on it. We have our clip release right there. The trigger is pretty standard bolt action type material. And in addition to dropping a sear there, it also drops a bolt lock lever, so that when the when the trigger is pulled, the bolt can either can be removed or reinstalled. Our ejector is right here. It's spring loaded, so that when the bolt goes forward over it, it presses down into position. When you retract the bolt uh, with an empty cartridge, the ejector comes up into this cut and kicks the empty cartridge out the top of the action. And then here's our little sliding latch, which again I think is uh, to force the clip to remain in the magazine of the rifle after it's empty, so that you don't lose it. That, the idea of like keeping clips during training perhaps seems to me the sort of thing that would appeal to um, a country like Afghanistan that, while it may have been setting up some manufacturing capability, wasn't in a position to just go wasting expensive machined goods. As for the provenance of this rifle more recently, it was purchased uh, in the big market outside of Bagram Air Force Base a number of years ago by someone in the American military, uh, who then uh, was able to export it back to the United States. So this has been in Afghanistan, or was in Afghanistan, uh, for the vast majority of its life, and only came back fairly recently. The vendor who sold this rifle uh, told the buyer that it was the only example that they had ever seen, which I wouldn't doubt. Um, the buyer, despite being a, a fairly reasonably educated gun person, also had never seen one before. Uh, and when he showed it to me I was really taken aback, because I'd never seen one before either. But it was fascinating to see uh, the obvious connection to Schlegel milk. Unfortunately, as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, I was able to locate no actual historical resources that reference specifically this carbine. I can't find, in fact, any other acknowledgement of a Schlegel milk carbine in Afghanistan. However, it's pretty clear to me that this is not a fabricated, locally produced rifle. Uh, there are way too many similarities to the Schlegel milk system. I mean, this is obviously a Schlegel milk rifle or carbine. Um, and the manufacturing quality is such and the coincidences of its origin just all fit that I would be extremely surprised if this isn't a legitimate Spandau manufacturer cobble accepted Schlegel milk carbine. I would love to hear from anyone who might have another example of one of these guns or something uh, you know, that references it or is similar to it or related in some way. Uh, hopefully this video can serve as sort of a nucleus point for anyone interested in trying to find out more about these particular rifles. I do want to give a big thanks to uh, three different people who were very helpful uh, in helping me attempt to research this rifle. The first being Miles Vining, 
of Sila Report. Uh, he focuses on Middle Eastern and North African firearms, and this sort of thing is right up his alley. Uh, also Vernon Easley and Nick Jensen Jones, who are co-authoring a book uh, published by Headstamp Publishing. Um, we don't have an exact publication date yet, but the book is The Emir's New Rifles, and it is a history of the, of the Kabul arsenal. So I'm looking forward to that book. The two of them were both very helpful in giving me some good background information on the Kabul arsenal and where this rifle likely came from. And finally, a big thanks uh, to the fellow who actually brought this rifle, this particular rifle, back from Afghanistan and loaned it to me for filming. You know who you are, thank you very much, and you have a very cool example here. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the video, thanks for watching.